Number 10, we have sewer two versus 191. Now this has a false interpretation and that is slay the unbeliever wherever you find them. Now you see reading the verses before and after actually gives some context and that's not necessarily what the verse actually says. Either way, when we look at Surah 2 verses 190, it says, fight in the way of Allah, those who fight you, but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. And then moving on to Surah 2 verses 191, it actually says, and kill them wherever you overtake them and expel them from wherever they have expelled you. And fitna is worse than killing. And do not fight them at Al-Masjid Al-Haram, until they fight you there. But if they fight you, then kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. And then moving on to Surah 2 verses 192, the next verse, it says, and if they cease, then indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So those scriptures there just really give some context of the actual text. Now moving on to number nine, Surah 3 verses 28. Here's the false interpretation of this one. Muslims must not take infidels as friends. And by the way, infidels are unbelievers. Now the Quran doesn't forbid Muslims from becoming friends with non-Muslims, but during wartime, it says that they should not join with the enemy. When we look in the Quran, we find this. Let not believers take disbelievers as allies, rather than and believers and whoever of you does that has nothing with Allah except when taking precaution against them in prudence and Allah warns you of himself and to Allah is the final destination and that's the full verse of surah 3 verses 28 next up let's look at surah 3 verses 85 here is a false interpretation for this one any religion other than Islam is not acceptable therefore Islam is not tolerant of any other religious group. Here's the thing, all religions usually say that their religion is the most correct or the most beneficial, so there's not necessarily anything wrong in and of itself with Islam making that same claim. However, in the Quran, you will find certain verses that actually esteem prophets in Judaism and in Christianity. So this does point to one aspect that Islam is tolerant in. Now the Quran says this, say we have believed in Allah and in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants, and in what was given to Moses and Jesus and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them, and we are Muslims submitting to him. That is Surah 3 verses 84. The Quran also says this in Surah 2 verses 256, there shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. The next misunderstood verse is Surah 8 verse 12. It goes as follows, Remember thy Lord inspired the angels with the message. I am with you. Give firmness to the believers. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Smite ye above their necks and smite all their fingertips off. And now for context, this was a verse that was revealed around the time of the Battle of Badr. The pagans of Mecca, they traveled more than 200 miles to Medina with an army of over a thousand men to kill Muslims who numbered around 300. By this verse though, Muslims are ordered to fight to defend themselves. Another verse in the same chapter, Surah 86 verses 61 says this, but if the enemy incline towards peace, you also incline towards peace and trust in God for he is one that hears and knows all things. And that is a proper context of that verse. The next misunderstood verse we're gonna look at is Surah 9 verses 123. And this is how it goes. O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near and let them find in you hardness and know that Allah is with those who guard against evil. Now this verse, according to Muslim sources, is speaking about the hypocrites who were among the Muslims in the time of the Prophet. The unbelievers who are near you were in actuality non-Muslims posing as Muslims who sought to corrupt the believing Muslims from within, you know, destroying them from the inside out. Now this instruction was to fight them and fight in this context is to resist the skepticism of these hypocrites. The next two verses actually point out that this is actually about hypocrites. And whenever a new chapter is revealed, some of the hypocrites ask the believers in jest, whose faith has increased because of this? 
As for those who believe, it will certainly increase their faith, and they are joyful over that. And that was taken from Surah 9 verses 124. Now for number five, another misconception that's similar to number six, all Muslims are Arabs. Well, Islam is often associated with Arab people, but the fact of the matter is that Arabs make up around 15% of all Muslims. So like I mentioned, most Muslims are in Asia and the actual country with the largest population of Muslims is Indonesia, which stands at approximately 225 million people. Also, the population of Iran totals about 82 million people, and Iranians are Persians, not Arabs, and most of the Iranian population are Muslims. So yeah, Arabs don't even make up anywhere near the majority of Muslims in the world. The next misconception to look at is Muslims are either Sunni or Shia. Like Christians and other religions, there are different sects and branches of Islam. The two major and most well-known branches are Sunni and Shia, but there are many many other subgroups with different teachings and different practices. Also, there are different Islamic schools of thought and law. There are Muslims though that hold the view that other groups who call themselves Muslims aren't actually Muslims, but that in itself is just one belief. Some other notable Muslim branches are Sufis and the Nation of Islam. Number three, I had to put this one in this episode, Jihad. The meaning of the Arabic word Jihad is struggle. It usually means a struggle of one's own soul against sinful desires. So it doesn't mean holy war in the sense that Muslims are warring against humanity. This type of struggle or jihad is to ensure that peaceful communities continue to exist on the planet. Of course, self-defense, if someone is attacking your home, your community, or your nation is acceptable to protect yourself. However, offensive aggression is prohibited completely in Islam. The misconception at number two is Muslims don't tolerate other religions. Some who claim to be Muslims can at times be very forceful in their beliefs and how they talk about other religions, Muslims actually hold the view that they are not the only ones who worship God. Jews and Christians, for example, are called people of the book in Islam, meaning that they are people who previously had received revelations from God. Also, when we look at the Quran in Surah 2 verses 256, it says, there is no compulsion in religion, meaning do not force anyone to become Muslim for Islam is plain and clear. And the final mixed inception we're going to look at in this episode is Islam oppresses women. Sadly, most of the oppression of women by Muslims that is publicized in the news is due to local customs and traditions. Muslim women have been presidents though, as well as prime ministers of nations, and violence and aggression towards them and forcing them against their will is not prohibited in Islam. Muslims are to care for widows and orphans and the poor, as well as treat their women with great respect. The Prophet Muhammad also taught people to be very friendly with their wives and even stated that wives should actually be their husband's best friends. In one hadith, it says the following words. The Prophet said, the best of you are those who are the best to their wives and I am the best of you to my wives. Unfortunately though, many Muslim women have been oppressed. However, this is a major issue that goes beyond just being oppressed by other Muslims. Abuse towards women is not any higher among Muslims than among other people of different religions or no religions at all. At the end of the day, we should strive to continue to show respect to anyone regardless of their beliefs and their genders. At number 10, Shias don't pray to God. Yeah, there's a lot of other Muslims who believe that Shia Muslims do not pray to God at all. And instead, they pray to Imam Ali or Imam Hussein or not pray to any deity at all. Now, this is a false belief and the main belief of all Muslims is the belief in one God or Allah in Arabic and God alone. Shia Muslims also believe in one God and they love God just as much as any other Muslim. Shias have a different Quran. Now this is a very popular lie and it's often cleared up pretty easily but nevertheless the misconception does still exist. Shias believe that there is only one Quran and the one of the miracles of the religion of Islam is that the Quran was preserved. 
preserved in the original form. It's believed that the Quran now is the original Quran recited by the Prophet Muhammad, and all Shias read the same exact Quran. Next up at number eight, Shias don't pray five times a day. Now this is one of the most common misconceptions and lies. The five daily prayers that all Muslims perform are required to be done. And Shia Muslims, they pray five times a day. The only difference is the timings of the prayer. Shias pray the five prayers, but they split them up into three times a day. And now the reason for this is because the Quran only mentions three times of prayer during the day. Also, Sunni Muslim scholars agree that the Quran mentions only three times for prayer. However, they keep to praying five times a day based on hadith. But there are many Shia Muslims who actually pray five times a day like Sunni Muslims. All right, next lie to clear up is that Shias pray to a rock. This lie comes from Shia Muslims praying on a torba, which is a round piece of hard clay that your forehead touches during prostration while you're praying. But Shia Muslims, they do not pray to the rock. The Shia belief is that while prostrating in prayer, their foreheads must touch natural earth and not something artificial. This is done to follow what the Prophet Muhammad did during his prayer. There are several hadiths that state that the Prophet Muhammad lifted his head from prayer and the mark on the earth could still be seen where his forehead was, like the hadith found in Bukhari. And it says, and I quote, the Messenger of Allah said, the earth has been made for me a place of prostration and a means of purification. So wherever a man of my ummah is, when the time of prayer comes, let him pray. Moving on to number six, Shias don't love Prophet Muhammad. Ooh, okay. So Shias are often believed to only love Imam Ali and Imam Hussein. It is true that Shias love Imam Ali because of his role in preserving Islam as well as other qualities that he had. And they also love Imam Hussein and many other devout companions and family members of the Prophet Muhammad because of their devotion to their religion. Now there's a passage in the Quran specifically in Surah 42 verses 23 that Shias base their belief on and it goes as follows. That is of which Allah gives the good news to his servants, to those who believe and do good deeds. Say, O Muhammad, I do not ask of you any reward for it, but love for my near relatives. And whoever earns good, we give him more of good therein. Surely Allah is forgiving, grateful. Number 10, we have Surah 2 verses 191. Now this has a false interpretation and that is slay the unbeliever wherever you find them. Now you see reading the verses before and after actually gives some context and that's not necessarily what the verse actually says. Either way, when we look at Surah 2 verses 190, it says, fight in the way of Allah those who fight you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. And then moving on to Surah 2 verses 191, it actually says, and kill them wherever you overtake them and expel them from wherever they have expelled you. And fitna is worse than killing. And do not fight them at Al-Masjid Al-Haram until they fight you there. But if they fight you, then kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. And then moving on to Surah 2 verses 192, the next verse, it says, and if they cease, then indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. So those scriptures there just really give some context of the actual text. Now moving on to number nine, Surah 3 verses 28. Here's the false interpretation of this one. Muslims must not take infidels as friends. And by the way, infidels are unbelievers. Now the Quran doesn't forbid Muslims from becoming friends with non-Muslims, but during wartime, it says that they should not join with the enemy. When we look in the Quran, we find this. Let not believers take disbelievers as allies rather than believers. And whoever of you does that has nothing with Allah except when taking precaution against them in prudence. And Allah warns you of himself and to Allah is the final destination. And that's the full verse of Surah 3 verses 28. Next up, let's look at Surah 3 verses 85. Here is a false interpretation for this one. Any religion other than Islam is not acceptable. Therefore, Islam is not tolerant of any other religious group. Here's the thing, all religions usually say that their religion is the most correct or the most beneficial, so there's not necessarily anything wrong in and of itself with Islam making that same claim. 
However, in the Quran, you will find certain verses that actually esteem prophets in Judaism and in Christianity. So this does point to one aspect that Islam is tolerant in. Now the Quran says this, Say we have believed in Allah and in what was revealed to us and what was revealed to Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, and the descendants, and in what was given to Moses and Jesus and to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them and we are Muslims submitting to him. That is Surah 3 verses 84. The Quran also says this in Surah 2 verses 256, there shall be no compulsion in acceptance of the religion. The next misunderstood verse is Surah 8 verse 12. It goes as follows, Remember thy Lord inspired the angels with the message, I am with you, give firmness to the believers. I will instill terror into the hearts of the unbelievers. Smite ye above their necks and smite all their fingertips off. And now for context, this was a verse that was revealed around the time of the Battle of Badr. The pagans of Mecca, they traveled more than 200 miles to Medina with an army of over a thousand men to kill Muslims who numbered around 300. By this verse though, Muslims are ordered to fight to defend themselves. Another verse in the same chapter, Surah 86 verses 61 says this, but if the enemy incline towards peace, you also incline towards peace and trust in God for he is one that hears and knows all things. And that is a proper context of that verse. The next misunderstood verse we're going to look at is Surah 9 verses 123 and this is how it goes. O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near and let them find in you hardness and know that Allah is with those who guard against evil. Now this verse according to Muslim sources is speaking about the hypocrites who were among the Muslims in the time of the Prophet. The unbelievers who are near you were in actuality, non-Muslims posing as Muslims who sought to corrupt the believing Muslims from within, you know, destroying them from the inside out. Now, this instruction was to fight them and fight in this context is to resist the skepticism of these hypocrites. The next two verses actually point out that this is actually about hypocrites. And whenever a new chapter is revealed, some of the hypocrites ask the believers in jest, whose faith has increased because of this. As for those who believe, it will certainly increase their faith and they are joyful over that. And that was taken from Surah 9 verses 124. Now halfway in at number five, we have Surah 48 verses 29. And it goes as follows, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. Now the disbelievers in this verse refers to those who persecuted and attacked the Muslims. This is not a verse directing Muslims to just go out and mistreat other non-Muslims. Moving on to number four, here we look at Surah 98 verses six. Now this is the false interpretation. Anyone who doesn't call themselves Muslim is going to hell. But you see, the actual verse goes like this. Verily, those who disbelieve from among the people of the scripture and al-mushrikun will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. Now, according to Islam, Muslims, they're not allowed to say that any one person is going to go to hell just because they call themselves uh, a Christian, a Jew, or they have a different religious label or no religious label. Each person's destination when it comes to the hereafter is only known by God. Now, moving on to number three, here we have Surah 5 verses 101 to 102. Now, here is a false interpretation of this one. Do not question Islam. Well, the full verse reads like this. O ye who believed, ask not questions about things which, if made plain to you, may cause you trouble. But if you ask about things when the Quran is being revealed, they will be made plain to you. Allah will forgive those, for Allah is oft forgiving, most forbearing. Some people before you did ask such questions and on that account lost their faith. Now, this is in reference to those people who ask useless questions about when a revelation is revealed from the Quran. And here's the thing, if all their questions were answered, well, it would have made the duties of their faith and practicing the religion a lot more specific and therefore making it a lot more difficult to perform. 
Moving on to number two, here we have sewer eight versus 65, and this is a false interpretation. The unbelievers are stupid. Urge the Muslims to fight them. Now the correct reading of that verse is this. O prophet, urge the believers to battle. If there are among you 20 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. And if there are among you 100 who are steadfast, they'll overcome a thousand of those who have disbelieved because they are people who do not understand. Now, Islam teaches that this verse was revealed to motivate the Muslim army, which was less in number than the opposition in the Battle of Badr. Now, we end this episode off with the most misunderstood verse of the Quran in this episode, and that is Surah 22 verses 19. Here is the false interpretation first. Punish the unbelievers with garments of fire, boiling water, melt their skin. But this is not describing an Islamic punishment to be administered, but rather it's a punishment that happens in hell. Here is the more correct translation of the verse, along with verses that say that this is the punishment in hell. When we look at Surah 22 verses 19, it says, These are two adversaries who have disputed over their Lord. But those who disbelieve will have cut out for them garments of fire. Poured upon their heads will be scalding water. Now, Surah 22 verses 22, it says, Every time they want to get out of hellfire from anguish, they will be returned to it and it will be said, taste the punishment of the burning fire. And then we have the following verse that contrasts what those who are granted paradise will experience. And just notice the similarity when it comes to the symbolism of being clothed with garments. And this verse that I'm referring to in Surah 22 verses 23 says, Indeed, Allah will admit those who believe and do righteous deeds to gardens beneath which rivers flow. They will be adorned therein with bracelets of gold and pearl and their garments therein will be silk.